Happy holidays, everyone. Hello. Um, call to order and roll call. So I call the meeting to order at 9.04 a.m. Who wants to do roll call? Are you good? All right. Tom DeBee? Yeah. Jean Christopher? Yeah. Arlene Zortman? Yeah. Lauren Seeley? Here. Sally? Right? Sally Seeley. I always, I always do that. I know it's so. um, And staff present, Harold Dominguez? Kendra oh. Daniels. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna name them. Yes. I'm I'm just name I'm glad you were naming this. I will. I, that makes sense. We are I see. Here. We are here. I see for the yeah. recording. Harold Dominguez, Kendra Daniels, Molly O'Donnell, Lisa Gallinart, and Kathy. Perfect. Thank you so much. Go on to item number two. Approval of the minutes from the November 15th, 2022 meeting. Do I have a motion? Well, I sort of read through them really fast, and I didn't see anything, uh, you know, major. So I will not put them in. I'll second. Um, I would like to actually have a minor change to it. I think, uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> well, I, I think it just it was in 4A. I think if we just have a little clarification that, because uh, we, we talked about the rent increases for Hearthstone. So it says Hearthstone at Cobra Crossing will increase 7.2%. The Lodge will increase 7.49%. Residents of both properties will be receiving communication statement changes. Uh, and they will have a comment period where they can reach out to HUD representative directly. I think we might just want to say that it's a HUD increase and not actually increase directly to the residents. Yeah, because that may have changed actually because they, they brought it down. They don't get the full request. Well, I guess for the minutes. But at the minutes, yeah. Right. The time, yeah. I think it was just kind of unclear. Okay. Noted. Um, okay. Okay. Any other changes? Or... All right, so let's vote. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Passes unanimously. <clears throat> let's go on to number three. Public invited to be heard. Any from anybody from the public? I'm gonna find somebody. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, let's go on to item four, uh, organizational updates, A, advisory board and member selection update. Uh, this is just a, a quick statement, just uh, the, the interviews that happened which with Arlene and Jean and staff support occurred. We made recommendations to the board of commissioners and then they held interviews for all applicants on Saturday. And then the appointments are set for the 20th and I'm waiting to hear back from Michelle at what point the they select people get notified or if it's happens at the right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, so that's all there. <clears throat> just hoping to have a, a little more detail, but I'll have to just report back if we have anything. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, all right, let's go under five development and project updates. Okay, so we've got a lot of moving pieces mm -hmm. going on. Uh, so the village place. We held a resident meeting last Monday to give an update on what's next. Um, the schedule is still on as it was as of last March when we pushed the construction to 2024. So uh, we chatted about uh, the survey that we put out to residents asking for their priorities of what they would like to see in the building addressed. And then um, those were due Friday. Have they been collected? Yes, they've all been Saturday. Yeah. Um, so we're summarizing those. And then just on last Thursday, the request for proposals period closes for architects. So we had interviews set up. We got five proposals. We're interviewing three um, between Friday and next Tuesday. What phones are you guys interviewing? We're going to be interviewing Alms 2S, ALMS 2S. Um, I'm blanking. Oh, are you in the cone of silence? Are we in the cone of silence? Oh, okay. Well, we had five applications, five proposals. You can tell me later. Yeah, well, let me just double check on that. Because we're, I guess, the ranking yeah, yeah. process in college. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Harold. Um, so we should have a selection next week and then work on contracting in January and send that contract to the board in January as well. Um, generally, we asked for, we're ranking based on experience with senior properties, experience with LIHTC resyndications, um, you know, overall 
qualifications and experience with tenant in place we have. So, and cost is one factor. So that is moving right along. We um, are speaking with the existing investor here, WNC. We're working on, they're wishing to exit. And so we're gonna go ahead and exit them early in 2023 and not do it all at the same time in November when we're gonna do a new deal as well. Um, so we're getting that sorted. And they're coming at the end of the month to come walk through. To walk through. And then um, we are, <coughs> Uh, doing funding applications, trying to get as much funding together as possible. So you will probably see, I'll be putting out a request to neighboring communities, just seeing if they already have ideas for their PAB. I know it's 2023 and often if people put it out for competitive, they don't know for several months, but we know that we'll need more PAB. Um, so we're gonna see if neighboring communities are transformational affordable housing grants. So we spoke with DOH about that and First of all, we need to wait until we have a conceptual design and ready for our tax credit submittal in March because they basically told us, I mean, they just don't see um, preservation and resignification as very transformational. And I said, well, this is the, uh, exactly, I know, street. I, we don't we've have already started our marketing efforts on why that still makes sense. Um, I wanted to put in in the very first round, which was, a notice of intent to apply December 10th, apply by January 1st. When we coordinated with them, they, they recommended that we wait until we have everything that we're gonna put in with tax credit in March. Um, but we, they also, I made the case, I said, this is the absolute poster child example project for why preservation is necessary. What happens when you, they, you know, they, there was a rehab here, but it was nothing um, on the interiors, it was just critical systems. And so when you don't do a rehab for 30 some years, I mean, you, this is the exact reason why preservation is so critical. So I'm still planning on throwing in, but um, we don't know how successful it will be. How old is this building? 1990. It hasn't had an interior update since. So. Um, we're going to try. So then are we seeking another investor if the other one wants yes. to go on? Yes. Okay. Yes. We're going to start that process. So it's rolling right along. We are still on schedule. All of the architect's proposals are match up with our schedule as well. So it's looking pretty good there. And we have a market analysis happening for the CPWD building. Um, the CPWD is interested in purchasing it, so we'll get that information and then start talks with them because we've already separated that from the deal. <coughs> so lots going on though. Um, oh, and I have CBD down here, so that's good. Yeah. So Zinnia, this is the permanent support of housing over by the suites. Um, we're, they're doing gap funding. It's not a huge amount, but there is gap funding that they're looking for and we've coordinated what, what the city can uh, participate in on that. And the closing is set for about May at this point, and construction right after. Um, they're in, they're in the thick of entitlements and getting everything figured out there uh, for final details of site plan, like that type of thing. Um, we were shooting to have the transfer of the property happen by the end of December. Um, in reading the option agreement, the, it, the, the possibility is December 31st was really um, the deadline for the site plan review. So we're giving it an extra <coughs> month or two to um, sort out exactly how the, um, what's it? I'm sorry, I'm blanking on where we were with that. but. I will get you an update. Anyway, we're still planning on transferring the, oh, environmental. Yeah, we have to do the environmental review before the transfer can occur, so we're gonna get that taken care of for DOH. Um, and then do the transfer of the property in its own transaction ahead of the May closing. Everything else is, is moving there though. We haven't heard about any new cost escalations on, on later uh, cost estimates, so. Everything else is just plugging along for May. 
Um, lots of work going on at the Hover land as well. Uh, so this is the land that LHDC owns. Um, we put out, we completed the, the process getting uh, developer proposals for that. We went ahead and selected a developer, it's Penrose, and um, we're moving forward. We're gathering a bunch of information for them through this year, and then we're going to kick off in full force next year with a goal to apply for tax credits in August as a first first round. It might take more than, well, unless we go for We'll see. We're still sorting out. We go non-competitive or then try for February 23, 9%. We're, we're tailoring that now. Um, in the meantime, we're talking with our uh, city divisions to talk about what kind of opportunities we might be able to do on the ground floor there regarding you know, community service type things that could benefit this family hub of, of a building. That's, Any that's the names? So we're going to, we still haven't approached the Stewart family, okay. but uh, that is what we're attempting to do, is okay. go that route. And then, I mean, we haven't sorted all of this, but um, the Stewart family, if we're able to include some of these community services, that a lot of that is the Stewart family's um, main you know priority as well so we'll see what opportunities might be there okay. okay and then finally recovery cafe so we have um we're working with recovery cafe to do an add-on at the suites and it is certainly not the easy route but if we can make it work the benefits will be so great so we're really doing everything we can to make it work um we you know, the investors all have to approve, and we haven't, I mean, primarily they seem favorable, but they always say, but we have to go through the attorney process, et cetera. Um, and so they just closed on a request for proposals for architecture services as well last week and interviewed um, several firms on the 9th, and they're making a selection now. And then the first phase of that will be the feasibility study to make sure that this really is possible to build here and we've built in our exit ramp so if it's not feasible that can still be covered by this cbg covid grant um, that's still an eligible thing and if we have to pivot then they're keeping an eye out um, for properties to purchase just to have a, a plan b if needed so we're still moving forward it's working out and we'll have a lot more information about exactly what's possible it's a six-week deliverable on that for these really study, so it should be around the beginning of February. Okay. And then what, what's going to be the funding source for the operations of the recovery cafe? They do. That's their own thing. Who does it? Our recovery cafe. That's a nonprofit. Oh, okay. So yeah. we would just offer them the space. We're we're around lease, so we're just, just going to do rent. Okay. Yeah, we're, well, we're just going to do a low product yeah. dollar ground lease. Gotcha. Okay. Um, <laughs> and then we just provide the services to the residents. Yeah, yeah. And other <laughs> community as well? Yeah, yeah. Okay, right. Okay. So we've gone round and round on that one. Um, I think the attorneys thought it would be easier if we didn't do the ground lease, but we did uh, full contracting to build it. And um, there's way too much risk for us on that side. Um, especially, on, it's really more on the city side because there's cost overruns. And we'd have to absorb it. We don't, frankly, have the staff to manage another construction project, and I just think your ground lease is cleaner. Mm -hmm. And so we're we're just going to go that route. Okay. So we're meeting with Recovery Cafe next Tuesday to go over all those details. So they'll build it. Yep. Yep. Okay. So we will grant the funds. <clears throat> we're going to support, you know, for um, like just <clears throat> traditionally, you know, how we do for other grantees, we're we're helping them meet all the requirements. But they will have, they will be the owner of the architecture contract and construction contract. I think they're eligible to apply for the other transformational homeless They are. Grants. Um, yeah. And they also have been thinking about trying to use opioid money. I don't know what their plan is for that. I'm even trying to think of that. But obviously, is that's that a, a topic. I don't know. We need to, that's what we're meeting on Tuesday to talk about all that. That's not because we have the first round of opioids. I think we're voting on that this afternoon. Oh, okay. So, so this is through the city, or is it other No, this agency? is the collaborative opioid dollars, because okay. I'm on that board. Okay. 
So, so no, well, I mean, they keep going the next year's yeah. cycle. Okay. Yeah. Which might make sense because we'll have real cost estimates there. Yeah. So, right. has, <clears throat> oh, has there been anything um, done about the veterans' place, or is that just still kind of where on hold? You mean at, at, as far as up here on Main Street or yeah. at the. Yeah, on 12th and May or wherever it was. So they're, they're interested in it. I think it's a timing equation for us. So we would need to, we need to get further down the road on Zinnia because it's who's in the, I mean, so I talked to Mark and we need to get together with Mark and his group to start talking through that process. But it's really the residents that we have in it and how all of that's gonna work and transitioning them if they're interested in buying it. So, oh, so we're not just talking office space, we're talking the units as well? So as like all of it, yeah. Like, okay. yeah. yeah. Because, I mean, it's, we're, we're all dealing with similar populations. And so that may make sense for a county. I mean, it's how many units are there? Yeah. So we have 10 units, and so it's not a lot. And if we can get a cash infusion to support the broader housing authority mission, but yet they're still housing people that we would house anyway, then we think it makes sense. But um, they're still focused on getting that built out there. And so that's part of the issue too, is they want to get further along and get that operational. Um, I will mention that our, the city's sustainability teams are looking for uh, a smaller apartment complex or, or multiplex to do, they have energy efficiency money that they need to spend and we propose Briarwood. Um, also because Adam, our, the, the HCI's CDBG specialist, it basically, you know, we, this is in our wheelhouse doing, doing rehabs for this type of thing so we can help them because they have to income qualify and they are going to find contractors who are like, we have all that. So um, we're working with them to see if Briarwood can be their test case. Who's that? Susan. Oh, Susan, and yeah. And Hannah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So is there any other questions? That was kind of a quick run through of everything going on. <laughs> and will Recovery Cafe be its own standalone building or will it be an add on to the suite? So it has to be an add on. As it's as going to be kind of like a breezeway, we were thinking. Okay. But it has to officially touch the suites to be eligible for CBG. Yeah. I wish they would change that. Yeah. Make it a lot easier to spend CBG. All right. Uh, let's go on to number six items for input to the NLHA Board of Commissioners. Okay. So we're planning on taking Zinnia's property tax exemption policy to the board on January 31st. Um, but that's, so that's just a, a heads up that that would be coming, but really we've had a couple of, of developments happen regarding property tax exemption partnerships where we have had the owner of Copper Peak Apartments approach us um, because when they were first getting built several years ago, uh, the prior LHA board did, denied them a property tax partnership because their units were, uh, they have 12% units under 50% AMI and the rest are all 60. And the requirement at the time was 100% units under 50. So they didn't uh, do it then. And then now they are reaching out to see if we would consider it after the fact, because I think there's a new board and we have a revised policy. Um, so our policy as we wrote it and adopted back in February of this year, um, does not, it's not built for anything but new development because it's really accepting the fees at closing yeah. and um, assume, you know, you, you can edit the, the number of years of the, the compliance period, like we did four years for Christmas because that's when we're, how long we're in, 15 years typically for any other project. Right. So when we were considering this, um, our, the policy as we have it, which I've printed copies in case anybody wants to reference what I'm going over here. So I'll hand these out. Um, here's the, the policy, and this is the template calculator, but with Chrisman filled in, just so you can see, it's really easier to see with a project filled in. 
Um, we the, the max threshold that we have written in is 20% of your units, um, at least 20% of your units um, at 50% AMI or below. And so this project would not, the Copper Peak does not fit in. They are above the threshold as it's written. So they are making the case that, um, well, all right, we had to have 60% designated units for our financing at the time, but 40% of our units serve HCV tenants, um, much less than 50% AMI. So they're asking the housing authority to partner based on the population being served. We've done researching. Uh, I mean, so why would we consider this? I want to clarification. Mm -hmm. um, when you're saying 60% of their units, total units, I'm or 60% of the units that go to? So they have 12% of their units designated for 50% AMI or below, and the remainder is for 60% AMI. Is it 100% affordable, though? Yes. Okay. Okay. So mm -hmm. all it's of it is 100% affordable. affordable. Okay. But that's their unit mixes. Okay. So one of the things that came up in our joint retreat um, with the board slash council is really getting more people to take vouchers. Um, and so one of the things I was thinking about is, you know, putting a threshold, a minimum threshold of the number of voucher holders that they are you know, willing to accept. Mm -hmm. And so setting, you know, you know, you have to meet or exceed the number of affordable units based on our affordable housing policy, which they would do, and then throw in a caveat that you need to take, you know, at least 35% of your residents need to accept about or Walmart housing. Or we got to figure out the language on this. Right. Um, but voucher holders, of which the majority are voucher holders from the Walmart Housing Authority, or some version of that. So they can't, so it'll be interesting because um, you can't deny a voucher holder necessarily, but there's just some landlords that just try to avoid it as much as possible. They raise the rent high enough that yeah. You know, so so yeah. we can't deny we'll designate the can, units. Yeah, I mean, they don't play the game because there's some that don't take them right. Right. So with the question for this group, when, as I plan for what I'm going to present to the board January 31st, maybe it's just Zinnia under our current one, or do we want to think about our policy and how it's structured? <clears throat> do we want to add in something regarding voucher holders? Um, so they would not qualify, their unit mix would not qualify them currently. But he's asking for it basically, but would you consider the fact that 40% of our households are earning less than 50% and on vouchers. Um, and this is after this is not for closing, this is part way through. They're you know, they're just there. The other thing that since it's just a legislative action, I would like to put in is some requirements to be in the crime free multifamily housing. Mm -hmm. I would also like to have requirements about, you know, actually enforcing the crime free multifamily housing needs. Mm -hmm. Just because I know like that place in particular we have a lot of issues. So because it's a legislative action, I would like to put okay. really robust requirements <clears throat> in terms of managing the properties. That way if they don't do it, then they can lose their exemption. Yeah. And it's helping many other aspects of it. So you are we should be looking at some revisions for, for January is what I'm hearing. If they if they want to recommend that they do it, right. I would say we load on some other revisions on this to really help us manage other issues. So this 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 partnership policy only really contemplates a fee from LH to LAJ right. to partner. So I know where you're going. I think we yeah. got a the second piece of this agenda is that yes. So the other so the several things we're considering. Allowing this PAX exemption partnership for existing properties, not just new builds, um, adding on requirements or, or well, considering 
HCV or maybe actual tenant AMI, one of the two, mm -hmm. um, and then adding on like crime free and any other thing else we think of. The second major piece that our policy doesn't have that many other example policies do have is a right of first refusal for so, purchase option. Right, for both. Right. So we have run that question to our attorney, just what would it look like and what, um, anyway. The, really what it is, is just, if we're gonna be putting in, giving you this benefit at, your, at the end of your compliance period, if you're not gonna stay affordable, then we should have a right of first refusal to keep right. the units affordable. So we don't have that in our policy currently. Um, and it, it, I, I mean, I think that when we were contemplating this early in the year, um, when Kathy was developing this in 2021, we were really thinking our, our partnership agents, it's Christmas is what we were really thinking right off the bat. And now it's really mushrooming a little bit into more than just that. Um, it is a revenue source. The fee is a revenue source for us at one time. And then, um, and we have an application fee that's supposed to cover our, um, our costs to implement the partnership, which really, if it's at closing, it's, it's taken care of. But if it's not at closing, if it's in the middle of a property like this, then we would have attorney fees because we have to be a, a special limited partner on their ownership structure. And then their documents. Yep. So we'll have to do all of those things. That's what Copper Peak would have to do all of that. It's not just a give us money and here you go. Here's your exemption form. Um, so there would. So that's what that fee, the five thousand dollar application fee, is intended to cover those costs that we would occur incur because of getting on the partnership. Um, so those were the several things I was considering to add on to this policy. Um, some things to consider if we're going to add on the right of first refusal and the purchase option. Um, the end of year compliance snafus that come up. Like we're learning this now for a property that we want to build. The cost to acquire the property is the same as the cost to acquire the partnership space you know, to take over like you guys are talking about doing with um, this one. And it, the way it was written was um, the real property value being assessed by a property appraiser, which okay. they're valued differently. One is you're actually buying property, and the other one is you're just buying a partnership. Mm -hmm. So something to consider was if we draft these, if we include this, is that, and then the rover, you know, that just always creates a lot of issues. So I would just say put a lot of thought into how we want to word it now to avoid issues at the end of the compliance period. Are you looking at policy revisions to Boulder County to address not, this or? Not for, I don't know. I just actually got a copy of our policy the other day from our executive director because we have a lot of people asking us to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I just know from one that we joined in 2006, it was not well written okay. to our definition. Okay. So. <clears throat> Will you share yours? I I don't, we might have it somewhere yeah, else if you don't mind. Yeah. That would be great. Because we pulled some examples to start uh, seeing what the rope for language looks like. Mm -hmm. I, I've got another point of view on this, um, especially your comment about crime free. Uh, if we're going to get into partnership with somebody that's been in existence, I'd like to get feedback from the clients. What has their management style been like? What is it like living there? Just get it down to the nut. I'd like to know what kind of environment that management what problems are there. creating. But what kind of environment yeah. is management creating? Because mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm not interested in linking up with somebody that's got a rotten reputation mm -hmm. and they don't have the best reputation in town. Uh, and I, I would like to, to really cover the waterfront if we're going to get involved. I was saying that they're a Chaffa or Light Tech property getting their last um, inspection reports and their last um, tax credit compliance reports to see their standings with Chaffa because you don't want to get into a smaller building that yes. has a bad reputation that Chaffa's looking for a new partner on mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. yeah. we're part of that bad deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I'm saying. Let's cover the waterfront before we get, get involved legally. 
um, because you know money and asset and what have you is one thing, but what are we buying into? And what is what are, what is our leverage for improving it? So are you thinking at the right for first refusal mm -hmm. time frame, not at the head of the partnership? I I would do it before we got involved. Well, we, we've got every right to look at what their history has been. Well, I we can definitely pull that. That is yeah. that is documentation we can pull and keep. In terms of doing a, a learning from residents at this early stage when we're thinking about the partnership, that might be a little. Because we even if we do this, we're not technically linked to them. We're just a special limited partner in our right. partnership agreement, so we, they're not really tied to us in any way. We don't own it. We don't yeah, have responsibility over their management. Yeah, right I don't now. think they can give us legally tenant information. So right at right, right, first refusal, we could. Yes, that would be yes. part of the due diligence. Yeah, yes. Yes. Okay. Due diligence. yeah. yeah. and, 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 and we don't have to buy it if we don't want to. We got it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you understand where I'm coming from? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. And I think for an existing property, asking for that is certainly reasonable. The yeah. Chaffa the documentation. Chaffa, it definitely. Yeah. Or even whoever they're involved Which, with. Yeah. yeah, funders. But you'd want to know anyway because the whole like the whole partnership would be based on them complying. And if they're not complying, you pull out with no detriment to you. Right. Yeah. And they most likely have to get all these people's or agencies' approval to add us on as an SLP. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm just a little gun shy of anything that has LHAs. <laughs> right. Okay. So, what's the benefit to the property after the fact of closing that? What, what, what are they uses? Property tax. Property tax. That's, that's so it, right? For this asked. property, they paid in 2021 $258,000. That's cheap. Mm. Yeah, it's very cheap. Holy, have they got that much money? Just oh, it's just the difference between one. <laughs> oh, geez, that's cheap. So, yeah, it is. And that's the other thing is when you write in your ROFR or purchase option, you want it to be the tax exempt price because you want it valued at tax exempt prices, not. Mm -hmm. Market yes. price yes. because you don't want to pay more. They'll make more money if they sell at market rate, but we're not going to buy it for market rate. I've got a whole analysis here from Ben Doyle, though. Yeah. Oh, he'll, he's got yeah. you. <laughs> if you're working I'm with sure that's in here somewhere, I'm yeah. going to just digest it. Yeah, Ben's great. So I have a question, and it's um, really, I think, probably for new development because I'm, I don't know how you could back it up and do it otherwise. So one of the things that we heard quite frequently, or I guess I should say I heard, um, with interviews was the no smoking sites. Now, I was up at Centera um, not too long ago, and they've got a 50 foot, you know, you have to be 50 feet from the building for smoking rather than 25. If we go into new building, is there any way we can make it property free rather than just building free? Um, don't know because I think you have to have. So I'm going on this from an employer standpoint, and I think you have to have. I know as, a, as an employer, you have to have designated smoking sites for your employees. I would be willing to bet there's something in there for multifamily if, if you don't allow smoking in the units you have to provide somewhere for them to smoke. so enterprise green communities which is required for all light tech projects does not allow the encouragement of smoking on the property so we're not supposed to have a sign that says smoking area and an ashtray um, that doesn't mean they can't smoke on the property but we're not supposed to Specifically, encourage it. Yeah. it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Granted, that opens its own can of worms. So you don't have ashtrays, and you have some yeah, cigarette butts on the ground. Yeah. But um, that's a that's a interesting. Well, and the hard part of it is is the impact that you have. So if you don't do it, I mean, a 
it breaks smoke. Mm -hmm. So then the impact that you have on the adjoining properties. And so one of the guys that commented against Zinnia uh, is the adjoining property manager. And what he was commenting about is that too many people from LHA are going onto the property in the old plaza from the suites and activities on his property. Um, primarily, I think it's like smoking marijuana and stuff because you can't smoke marijuana on, on this property. And so you gotta be cognizant of that too. So if you think of like if we did it at Fall River and Spring Creek, but then everybody leaves there and they're in the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And so you got to kind of balance all of those issues. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of on that, he has posted and worked with Sarah. Um, so he does have trespassing mm -hmm. affidavit signed and they're getting the signs up. So we do need to tell the residents of the suites okay. that if they're on that property, they will be trespassed. So, I mean, there, it's all of these things that you have to think of. But, you know, Molly's right. So you don't designate a smoking space, and then it's just a mess. But then it's, it's, not, it's yeah. good to have a, a, an outdoor seating area that is Far proper, away. distance away. <laughs> um, that is a There's logical a big gathering place. with sand in it that yeah. may not necessarily right. be an ashtray. And right, right. Yeah. Yeah. But I think in the design of these, we can design them where they're intentionally further away so that you don't have that as you're coming in. Now, mm -hmm. this area is interesting because the breezeway is not LHA. It's, it's, it, no, it's DEA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so this area poses its own issues. Mm -hmm. Is there a rule about no smoking within 25 feet of an entrance? Yep. Mm -hmm. And it is posted in the beginning of the breezeway, no smoking. And that's where mm -hmm. we still smoke. Yeah. Yes, we mm -hmm. come in. Yeah. Oh, that's in place, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I hope. Yeah. yeah, like so in the summer, we have rangers and stuff trying to. That's like trying to hurt cats, too. <laughs> Thanks for your feedback. I'm going to start working on some red lines, which you'll most likely see at the January meeting. By the way, your January meeting says the 17th on the bottom of this, but we, we had shifted to the 2nd. So it's actually the 10th, January 10th. Okay. Um, and when Erica gets back, she'll send out our 2023 calendar appointments. Uh, so I'll shoot to have some red lines for the 10th. So I'll go to the board on the 31st. Uh, let's go on over to uh, item number seven. Or did we, we cover the current request for partnership, right? Yeah, that was all. Okay, that was all. Right. So uh, seven was the resident quality of life. Where are we on the the uh, contract for twenty twenty three? I think I know. Is that part of the I? I yeah. So in that yeah. one, so we have funding that. Is coming in from trans transportation fund that is part of I think the contract and then we have health and human service funding I believe that comes in for via so those recommendations are coming in next week at the city council meeting mm -hmm. and so once that's done then they'll they'll go into that contract and we'll probably take it month to month moving forward until we get the new contract done Okay, so we're, yeah. you're maintaining the service then? Yes. Yeah. All right. Yes. Diane and I are working with Via weekly yeah. on all that stuff. So the sign up sheets for the rest of the month are already in there. Okay. And okay. All right, item eight LHA report, update operations, occupancy report. We got a small bump in occupancy. Um, Briarwood filled up and the Heartstone is completely full at the moment. Um, we will be having a vacancy at the Briarwood due to the resident passing. Let's see. Aspen Meadows uh, neighborhood, 
we have a pending eviction there that's not listed on here Friday from the event on Thanksgiving. Okay. Is it hearing on Friday? Yes. Or? Okay. Yeah, it's Friday, 10 o'clock. Okay. okay. Um, Resident is still in the unit. There was police activity there last night, so I'm still waiting for the notes from Sarah for that unit, so I don't know what happened. I just said other agencies assist on my daily briefing. We have cameras watching. <laughs> um, let's see. Fall River, um, uh, some of these are PVD units, so we have the suites, Fall River, who both have PVD units. HCB is trying to fill them um, with the suites. We have a lot of vacancy, but MHP and LHA are running into the same issues. We're mailing out 20 packets and one person response. Yeah. Um, so um, I know Tracy and I are working on the suites to possibly start opening that wait list every six months so that we have good active names. Because what MHP and us are both seeing is a lot of the people on the wait list are homeless. Um, they don't update their addresses or they're on general delivery. They're not checking their mail. Their caseworkers have lost contact with them. So by the time they come up, every contact way we have is dormant, but we still have to give them the weeks to week period to respond once mailing. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're both talking about different ways. Um, and like I said, Tracy and I are thinking almost um, for the suites, we'll need to open up every six months just to keep a good list and keep those filled. Um, MHP has four units ready to go, and LAJ has three ready to go. Yeah. Um, managers are calling the wait list. I know Kat was calling after hours last night, still trying to get people, because people just aren't answering or not interested. Oh, too low of income, found something already, not ready yet, got into a piece, they have to wait a year, so. Yeah. She called from <clears throat> four to seven o'clock last night, just mm -hmm. making calls. And this wait list is currently open. Mm -hmm. So here, yeah. yes, okay. Um, so we're trying to fill. The down unit, um, we've added another unit at the suite, 7312. Um, it's taken the record for the highest meth unit. When we did the eviction, there was stacks of foil. Um, in the unit, meth was found in the unit, tested. Um, so that one's going to be down for a while. 7114. They are trying to get that one back online by the end of the year so that it doesn't have to be reported to Chaffa on 8823 as a down unit. Um, 305, that one is, um, the, the adjuster approved it. We're just working out some flooring issues with our vendor and in-house, just trying to figure out what's the best way to go forward. Um, B2, we are pending their post-cleaning sampling reports. The first round of cleaning did not get all of it. Um, to the point we've removed the door and the, there is a board boarding of the unit right now. Um, Fall River, same issue. We, they had to go in and remove the window seals, even any extra porous service they could find in the unit trying to get that to pass. So in, in terms of the people that were in these mm -hmm. units, how long were they in these units approximately? I mean, are oh. we talking about these are like long tenants? No, so 7312, yeah. she was there from July to December 1st. Yeah. And that was, that one came in at 2,950 parts per million mm -hmm. with so the suites, the she ones cooking. Um, this was the last one we did where the guns were on the bed. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So they were in there just a few months. Um, some of these other ones, um, 108, he was there for two years. He was the only occupant in that unit. Okay. So, and they think he was possibly cooking it before he became a boarder. Mm. So, in the unit. In the unit there. Yeah. 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 Um, B2, she was in there for about three years. Um, the living room and the bedroom were high, but the, the child's bedroom was very low. So, um, that's good. Yeah. That, you, that the child's bedroom was like untouched. 305, she was there for a couple years, but the unit had just been redone through the re syndication. Mm -hmm. And so, the bathroom and the one um, bedroom. Okay. So, I'm just gonna add on for meth. So, we had been. Um, we've been researching around, we've talked about this, the, some of the, the things coming out of New Zealand. So because I looked at the website for the meth alarm in New Zealand yesterday, I got a call from New Zealand. And 
he wants to set up a meeting to talk to us. Um, so, FYI. And I've been, talks, um, I've been talking to a company out of Broomfield, unfortunately 7312, which is my next unit, it's too high for them. But they have developed, they set a foam cleaner where they go through and they spray the whole unit with this foam and it basically cleans all the porous surfaces and these would be ones measuring in like the 1 to 500 range and it should be able to clean it with not having to rip out all the cabinetry and everything else to get into compliance. They're based out of Broomfield, they're working with another company out of Arvada, so we're going to maybe look at that going forward if we have another one that tests in those range that maybe that would be easier than reconstructing these obviously reconstructing these units if it's just a deep deep clean with this so yeah it just depends on the cost yeah so that's what we're free to show us that it's wrong I wouldn't take that on the alarm too like are you going to prove that it works yeah exactly with the alarm like with the whatever smoke alarm mm -hmm. type ones, we were like, unless you're going to put some in our, and do like a, a demo run. Yeah. and a test run, we don't really want to invest. Well, how do you, yeah, how long are you going to have to wait for it? Yeah. So I'm waiting to get more information. It stays not long. All right. <laughs> so I'm waiting for more information from them on that. Um, okay. And then I found a, the company that makes our Acumeth test that we do the wall swipes with, they now have a little device that you um, basically read the, the, the swipes, but will give you um, the level within like one tenth of it. So I'm looking into that and the cost and the, um, it's through AccuMets, it's the same company, it's a little black box that they have. Um, Make sure that we talk to Sadder and Vane. Okay. Um, so we can, if we're gonna do it, let's just do it holistically. Okay. And uh, I talk to Dane all the time. I report my own meth units because Boulder County's trailing. So as soon as I get test results in, I'm sending them to code enforcement, letting them know I have another down unit. So they, they're they helping me track them because the county's backlogged, I guess, with all these and keeping up with them. So um, on these meth units, I did have a chaffa reached out to me for a meeting because we seem to have a lot and they wanted to know why. And so I talked to Sarah and Dave with the police department and they said that we're actually, because we're, LHA is paying attention to their crime free reports, and this is what I told Chaffa, is that if we get a notation that there's meth in it, by law, we're supposed to do something about it. Mm -hmm. But she, a lot of landlords are ignoring it, and Sarah said she's starting to see that through the crime free program, mm -hmm. that there'll be a call with something with meth, but then the landlord doesn't do their due diligence. Mm -hmm. So when talking to Chaffa, what they're going to do, because we are on top of it, I send them monthly reports, where we're at, I send them the construction updates, everything so that they can see how we're moving through each unit. Mm -hmm. That though there's, they have to report the down units at the end of the year, they're not going to report them until they come back online so that they go in as corrected 8823s and not an open 8823. So basically we, Chaffa called us saying, looks like you guys have more meth units than most. And we go, mm -hmm. no. we're actually being incredibly transparent and in addressing it and so, that is very indicative of their appreciation, I think, that we are trying to do the right thing. So, I mean, the risk would be on the uh, landlords is that doing anything, they're yeah. renting out a unit that has high mm -hmm. test right. results mm -hmm. and they're not even testing for it. Yeah, correct. So once you acknowledge right. it, you have to remediate yeah. to do exactly. something in there. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. they're well, banking on their tenants are not going to sue them. Right. So well, they're going to get away with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's, the, that's why you're seeing the rise in these meth kits on Amazon mm -hmm. is um, like I wouldn't if I rented a place first thing I would do is get these meth tests and go in the unit. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So, yeah. Even hotel rooms I was thinking last time yeah. week when I was traveling I'm like I always need to carry get some yeah. personally to carry to test hotel rooms because yeah. you never know anymore. Mm -hmm. okay. Any questions on the occupancy? I, I just have one and I just mm -hmm. want to word this correctly. Um, one of the, you will remember in our interviews that there was a person who needed help. Did we reach out to that person? Um, yeah. Yes. Remember who she thought she was applying for housing? Oh, yes. Yeah, and she, I'm yeah. sorry, I can't recall her name off the top of my head. Oh, we don't know her name. Right. Yeah. Because uh, well, maybe something that she could work in one of these waiting lists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that, what did we do, Lisa? We took her phone number to Diana, Diana and Diana reached out to her, our admin 
mm-hmm. um, reached out to her because that's a book she gets a lot of similar calls and so she reaches them out i'm sorry gets them in veins in touch with our recovery resource mm-hmm. people i'm sorry my words are not working okay. mm-hmm. not sense. <laughs> yes, you so gather so gather what i was going for yeah, so diana was working and referred to her with this um, middle referral to senior services in Longmont if she's, new, if she's not a current resident to work with them to help get housing here in Longmont as well. Okay. 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 Good. Thanks. Um, brief property updates. Um, not a lot's happened, but we've had a lot of bingos. <laughs> we did year-end bingos at all the properties. Um, killer event. I'd say most properties had anywhere from a 40 to a 70% turnout. Um, this room was packed on both sides around the corner. Sweet yesterday, people were standing at the pony wall with bingo cards because there was no more sitting room. Um, so just a great event. Had a lot of donations from local businesses and we're still picking up more donations that they said just use for raffle prizes and stuff going into the new year. Um, some of the, the post, chicken donated, the roost, pump house, Hefe's Taco, Tangerine, a lot of restaurants, crack pots donated, gift bags. Um, and there, there's still more to pick up. So I know. mass emailed <laughs> one morning and got a great response from the city, um, local businesses. So awesome. even piercings and eyebrow tattoos. Tell me who's doing the eyebrow tattoos because my wife has alopecia. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. she had to do that, but she can't find the lady left mom mark. Yeah, there's, her name's Jessica. I'll, I'll get you her contact. And you gotta make sure they're certified. Yeah, they're, they're at. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 She's at one of the tattoo shops here. So. Um, they were really, I would just say, the team really came out for that. And um, the businesses were so excited to do this. So good. And so they, most of them said, contact us whenever you wanna do this again. And we'd be happy to, you know, support Long Launch. So awesome. we're excited. And then we filled in with a lot of the smaller little, you know, regular bingo prizes, um, mid things, but we used a lot of the gift cards and everything for the blackout prizes. And we were like, okay, let's do another round. And they were like, yeah. <laughs> and they were just cheering each other on and just yeah. support of the room. It was, yeah. Jean participated. It was, it, was awesome. it was a blast. And we had yeah. AMN over at Aspen Senior and it was, I think great for those who turned up because it was after the difficult week at AMN and they felt that they were, um, though we didn't have a lot show up, they reached out to her and said, thank you for inviting us. This is what we want. We haven't had this in years. Mm-hmm. We want to be part of the community and get back to doing stuff with the seniors. So, yeah. And I think we can make swag that just says, one more ball. Call <laughs> one more ball. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they're all like, one more, one more, just call one more. So it, it was just a lot of fun for my team. Um, we had a lot of staff out sick, so I'm sick, but I had a bingo team. So my two assistant managers and Andre and I went around to every property doing these bingos. So. And we just got the bingo equipment back. Yes. <laughs> I, I made Corinne, it was so funny because Corinne and I counted every ball last night to make sure Ray got all the balls. So. Oh, that was awesome. That was totally awesome. Uh, the, via shopping transportation, we're seeing increased um, signups and more participation. We're still working on a few kinks, but we've had three rides. So and Thursday's going to be the fourth ride. Mm-hmm. So. And I think we've got most of that. We've kind of developed some systems in place. Um, we bought more bags to just meet VIA's requirements and what our residents want. Let's see. The suites, um, our calls for service, um, public safety are still remaining low. I think I've not even seen a call in the last week and a half there. Um, we've got the two meth units going through mediation. Um, I did list this, but um, we did an Narcan training with the residents there. Um, a way forward, right here on Kaufman, came in and did a training and provided Narcan to all the residents and let them know when to when to use it. That you know it won't cause damage if you administer and it's they're not having an opiate overdose, but that it can work with prescription drugs. It can work with this, and they kind of went through this big slideshow presentation, wow. and they're going to mimic that same training at all of our properties here in 2023. And so um, as part of the opiate court, opiate grants and everything and funding that they get their Narcan through the county and that they are able to get into the hands of the residents here in Longmont. So, so they have kids then to the yeah, they, residents? Yeah, we all got Narcan. Um, they gave me four, so I have four sitting in my office, desk drawer, all my managers have it. They all, I had all, all my managers take the training that day as well and two of the maintenance guys so that they know when and how to use it. 
the residents. Are the residents able to use it? Yeah, the residents went to the training and the residents got the so Narcan as well. It also? Yes. Okay. So, and the lady was really good, Debbie, over at the away board, and she like literally walked through scenarios. And they had a guy, uh, one of their volunteers, come over and they administered Narcan to all. He laid on the floor and stuff, and they went through the whole thing like, in real life. So, mm -hmm. wow. which I think was very beneficial for the Suites residents to see it and, you know, let them know it's okay to do this. If you see somebody and you're questioning, you know, yeah. just do it. Mm -hmm. um, not much going on at Ask Meadows Senior. Um, still working on the, the flooring issues. Mm -hmm. uh, neighborhood, uh, we are pending that one eviction. Um, and Chaffa did come out a couple days after that and did a walkthrough of Ask Meadow Senior and Ask Meadow Neighborhood. Um, they were really impressed at the turnaround of the property. Um, we got a few write ups at AMSA for exit signs being out. <laughs> the lights weren't working, so. Um, those have all been fixed, and then um, a few write-ups in Corinne's unit from, um, it was the meth unit that was redone, and so we had to have Freedom Fire come out and just replace some sprinklers. So uh, all those corrections, I believe, have been now submitted to CHAPA. Let's see. Anything else? I think we've kind of already yeah. got over. <laughs> And we've hired for all our positions currently, except for the building attendant. I did six interviews last week. I do plan on making a full-time offer today to a building attendant and um, possibly a part-time. So. <clears throat> Any questions? Mm -hmm. Anything from you, Harold? Yeah, <clears throat> just in case you hear it, um, there's, um, not a lot, but we are getting a call here and there regarding the rental increases. Mm -hmm. And what's tended to show itself in this is, I think the two that we sent, it's where individuals are qualified for a one bedroom, but they're in a two bedroom. Mm -hmm. And so then their rates are going up mm -hmm. and working through those issues with them. But outside of like one or two, we're not hearing a lot. No. So And they've been voucher holders on yeah. this too. So. Their, their portion was increased by housing, not by LHA. Yeah, and it was the voucher that set up the, that created the increase, but mm -hmm. um, I think the meetings may work because it's been pretty quiet. Mm -hmm. So, also, I think they covered everything else. So. Mm -hmm. well, you were very specific several times as to how this was going to work, so yeah. Yeah, that's why I think the, the cross is on the ACV side. But it's your proof of this, you're in this, and here's this, and there you go. And so, I don't know, are you hear anything else? No. No. So, you know, are they willing to go to a one bedroom or do they want the two bedrooms? So, I mean, is that an option that we're. Yeah, doing? so I have one that, um, the last one that was reached out, she has already initiated a transfer to a one bedroom, which is what her voucher is approved for. Yeah. So. I don't think any of these, there's been a couple where they, they just want, and it's like, I want it to better and it's like, mm -hmm. and you need to pay for it to go Sorry. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And well, we're working through with housing as well, mm -hmm. even if it's um, Boulder County, LHA, whoever the voucher holder is, because mm -hmm. um, there is avenues if they're in a two bedroom and they do have the need for a two bedroom because of medical equipment, um, stuff like that, we can work through them and help guide them through the process. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other business out there? Number nine? So uh, let's adjourn at uh, 10.02 a.m. Cool, cool. Wow. Wow. Awesome. What happened?